Coming up on Kentucky Outlook, you know, while the gun control battle wages on, we have a lot of individuals asking, what's our role as a law-abiding citizen, especially since we live in the world in which we live right now, where terrorism is now part of our daily vernacular, school shootings are more commonplace, we even have administrators and lawmakers talking about placing police officers in schools. Recent incidents involving peace officers and civilians do have a lot of us asking, what are our boundaries? Well, the Bowling Green Police Department has an answer to that through the Citizens Police Academy, where they educate citizens. We're going to talk more about that. And later in the show, it's that time of year when all those authors and avid readers descend on Bowling Green for the annual Soki Book Fest. We'll have a preview next on Kentucky Outlook. Hello and welcome to Kentucky Outlook. I'm your host, Barbara Deep. We're going to be talking about the Citizens Police Academy. In particular, what's your role as a citizen to be a law-abiding citizen? We're going to find out more as we welcome to the program Captain Matt Edwards. Now, Matt Edwards is with the Bowling Green Police Department, but he's also the commander of something called the CRT, which stands for the critical response team. We're going to find out more about this. Thanks for being here. Thank you. In addition, we are joined by Ronnie Ward, who is with the Bowling Green Police Department. He's the face you see when there's an incident. He's the public information officer. And so it's the BGPD PIO. Too That's much correct. to say. Yes, That's correct. indeed. Let's talk a little bit about that because we live in a different world than it used to be. You know, that's easy to say. But as I mentioned in the introduction, Terrorists who would think that we would arrest terrorists in the small city of Bowling Green. We hear daily about school shootings anymore. And so people are asking, you know, what, what do I need to do to be a law-abiding citizen? How would you answer that? What I would say would just be very observant. And if you see something uh, that doesn't seem right, call us. Uh, call the police department and we will check it out. Uh, the days of the police, uh, police department uh, not wanting this information from the public. Uh, they don't exist. They've never existed in my career. So we always want information. If people call, we'll, we'll usually uh, send someone out, depending on the situation, and, and investigate it. And, uh, you know, we solve the majority probably of our crimes by citizens giving us the information. Oh, tips. tips. What people don't uh, understand, and we're going to talk more about the Citizens Police Academy and how you can get involved, but the city of Bowling Green in particular, and I suspect other cities work along the same lines, it's split up into zones. It is. Our, our city is divided into eight different districts and we assign officers to those districts. And we find that very beneficial because officers are able to get to know people in their districts and then they're able to find out more information because they kind of make friends uh, with but people. But it's not like it used to be the beat cop, right? You no. don't see a police officer walking the, walking no, the sidewalk, no. You don't see cops walking around in Harley no. anymore just because of the fact that geographically the city's grown much larger than you could able uh, have the ability to cover walking. So. They're all driving now, so yes. it has become a more, you're going to have to stop and get out and talk to people, uh, which is what we encourage our officers to do. And you they do. do that. So a lot of times if you see a policeman approaching and you're out there and they're just coming to say hi and introduce themselves, you might get a lot of panic. That's people, true. Right? People, people just aren't used to the fact of seeing friendly cops or cops walking up to talk to people. Well, and, and that's a different world now, as we talked about. So not used to seeing friendly cops are coming because the most encounters that they have with a police officer is when something bad's happening right. or something bad's about to happen. So through the Citizens Police Academy, this is kind of a way to say, well, come on behind the scenes. This is the way we do things, right? It, exactly. And we subscribe to the community policing model where we want to get to know people in the community. Uh, the Citizens Police Academy, obviously, uh, we met through that. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's obviously beneficial. But the community policing model, we get out and we talk to business owners and we talk to residents. Uh, we talk to people that don't really need our service at that time, but they may need it in the future. And we kind of lay out the groundwork for what we can, we can provide. And anytime you know someone and you can put a face to that picture mm -hmm. or a face to that phone number that you're calling in on, uh, it makes people a little bit more forthcoming with information. That's, that's real important. We, we, you know, if we could get behind the scenes, and we've got some footage we actually uh, borrowed from the city of Bowling Green about, about the Citizens Police Academy, but it's a 10-week course. You learn lots of different things. How did you come to decide, okay, we need to teach them this. We need to show them that. Well, everybody always wants the most exciting thing. So we, we go through all of the things that we do, all of the teams that we have, and we find the most interesting uh, they're interesting to us 
and that we think that citizens would like. And then we exploit those to the fullest. So we, we get people that are involved in that to come talk about it, to demonstrate it, and it does make it very interesting. Plus, the people that present absolutely love presenting the Citizens Police Academy. That I can attest to. Mm -hmm. Now, you also do a, f a felony stop, a regular traffic stop, and then you do a felony stop, okay, right. as part of the uh, practice in this class. So now the difference is a regular traffic stop you think is just going to be very routine, right? But if you know for a fact that the guy or the woman in the truck in front of you that you're pulling over might be a felon, a wanted felon in particular, you use a very different approach. That's, that's right. Mm -hmm. We don't always use the same approach to every situation. I guess situational dictates uh, the, the suspect's action dictates our actions a lot of times. And uh, we do show the, the citizen how we conduct those in our Citizens Police Academy. And we do that because we want the citizen to know uh, what that officer's experience as he's approaching that vehicle, uh, what that officer's seeing. Um, you know, it's it's easy when Hollywood makes it look uh, very <laughs> glamorous and uh, mm -hmm. it looks really neat on TV. Uh, but when you're actually doing it as the, as the, with the police officer there, it makes it uh, a big difference. Whole big difference, <laughs> and especially at night. You know, like you say, Hollywood has a tendency <laughs> to glamorize yeah. those police stops. But when it's dark and you have no idea what you're about to approach in that vehicle in front of you, something interesting, you shine a spotlight almost to, to blind temporarily the person in the vehicle in front of you. Makes sense. Yes. And something I learned that I thought was very interesting, you, you see police officers in those Hollywood movies, they stand behind the door, right? They get right behind, that's going to be their cover. But in reality, you encourage your police officers to get out into the periphery where they can't see you. Yeah, we, we, it's not that we're hiding from people, mm -hmm. but uh, we're, we're just trying to stay safe. And, and in a situation where we're not certain what's about to happen, we want to stay as safe as we can. So there are certain tactics to that, that uh, uh, a, a positioning and also a movement uh, that keeps us safe. Yeah, because that'd be the first place that the right. uh, bad person would shoot at, supposedly. Mm -hmm. yes. That's correct. What about training and police work over the years? We, we are living in a different time. We have uh, tasers. We didn't used to have those kinds of things. So how has that changed the way we do police work, or has it? Oh, we, I've been in police work a little over 10 years, and it has changed. Uh, the officer now, I think, is better equipped to handle uh, a lot of things you're seeing going on I around the country, these active shooter things at uh, schools or at public places. Uh, the officer equipment, uh, each individual officer is, I think, more equipped. Uh, they've had specialized training. Uh, we've learned from incidents around the, the country uh, how to uh, better mobilize and to handle those, those situations. Well, I'm, I'm thinking about that because uh, we learned that you also have a lot of equipment you have to carry with you. Now, the critical response team is a separate entity, so to speak, or like an offshoot, poor choice of words, <laughs> of the regular police department, right? That's an additional duty. What, what mandates calling out the CRT, the critical response team? What kind of incident would mandate that? We have a very strict, what I would call a th uh, threat matrix, where uh, it has to reach so many points of... Uh, I guess a threat level before we would call out our critical response team. Uh, and usually it involves, uh, it, well, it always involves a felony. Uh, it's a very serious crime. Uh, usually someone is in, in imminent danger uh, uh, from the suspect. Uh, and it just usually goes along those lines. That's It's an imminent threat to society or it could be an imminent threat to someone's an imminent threat to their self. Even if someone is uh, threatening to commit suicide? Uh, potentially if they have okay. a, uh, you know, if depending on what type of accessibility they have, weaponry and things like that, uh, to make it, it can make it more dangerous for them and for the, you know, the surrounding community. And who makes the call when it's a critical response, you know, that says that, you know, you mentioned the matrix and it's got to fit into those categories. Who ultimately says, okay, it's time to call them out? Uh, the lieutenant colonel ultimately makes that call at our police department. Now, we, I, as the commander, I will send up the recommendation. This is what we have on the point scale, uh, and I believe that we could come out and uh, assist in this incident, and uh, he will ultimately make that decision. And then you bring all that gear, because you talk about, I mean, you got enough on you right now, mm -hmm. but when the CRT is called out, are we talking about 80 additional pounds? Mm -hmm of equipment? Is that about what it weighs? It, it, probably so. Like it. Uh, I would think so. Yeah. There's, yeah. There, and there's a lot of other things that they carry in addition to what they're wearing. So yeah. that not only do they have the weight of what's on their bodies, they also are carrying other equipment too. Yeah, yeah so it, it is. Uh, that's why we're always uh, very critical of our members to stay in top physical shape. Uh, 
top mental shape as well because they're dealing with high risk incidents and at the end of the day we want a peaceful resolution and uh, that's that's very important that they we work to that goal. Dispatchers, you know you call 911, you get a dispatcher, you need to tell them what's going on. I'm sure a lot of people have heard different 911 calls and, and questioned the way in which it was handled, but there is a protocol. There is. They the dispatchers, uh, they memorize it after just a very short amount of time and they know what questions to ask. They know uh, what they're supposed to do when the answers to the questions come up to a certain way. So they ask a lot of questions. But what we want everybody to realize is while they're asking those questions, the police are coming uh, because there's more than one dispatcher involved. And once they immediately start typing into their computer system, it uh, pops up on another person's screen. They dispatch the police. So. We're trying to gain all the information that we can so that our officers are safe and that if we realize at some point in time during the call that per person is not safe, we want them to get out of the out of harm's way. That was my next question because often, again, we're going to blame it on Hollywood, but you'll say stay on the phone with me, but sometimes they will want them to stay on the yes. phone? Yes. If they realize that they're not in immediate danger where they are, they want them to stay on the phone. And then, of course, nowadays we have cell phones. Everyone's carrying a cell phone. Mm -hmm. So you can take that and run out of the house with you. All we want to do is we want to listen to see what's going on around you so that if we hear something that we need to uh, maybe get a little faster there, mm -hmm. a response, or, or we need to tell them to do something, then, then they, they can. Our dispatchers are very thorough and uh, very well trained and they can handle a lot of things. Oh, I imagine. And you, you get the call, you're in your car, you're closest, so you get to go? How does that work? Uh, usually if it, if it is a, a very, you know, if it's a serious call and whoever's closest will usually go to that call and, and handle that. It, and it me even as a captain, I'm not necessarily assigned to, to a district area, but if, you know, if I'm a couple blocks away and I hear that come out, I'm, I'm not going to say, well, I'm too high of rank to go to that. I'm going to go and assist that citizen if I can. So uh, that's how it works. And but. Uh, I guess theoretically we would like for that district officer to respond in that district so you, you have equal response times to each district, but sometimes that doesn't happen. That's not the reality of it. We're quickly running out of time. What's the biggest misconception you think people have about the police? That police eat donuts. <laughs> <laughs> I know you eat donuts. No, really, there's got to be something. Um, they they think that police, they think police aren't people and that we don't have families, we don't have lives, we don't have anything beyond police work. And really what we want to provide is good customer service to the citizens of Bowling Green, and then we go home to our families. You agree with that? I agree. I agree. Absolutely. Um, the Citizens Police Academy is offered every, all, every it's year, It's offered twice, twice a, a year? Twice a year, that's correct, 10 weeks. And uh, it usually starts in March and also in September. And so it's a 10-week course. You can learn lots about what it is like. Well, you learn about both sides, you know, what you're expected to do and be as a law-abiding citizen yes and what's you know where you're coming from on the other end. and we want the we want the citizens of Bowling Green to see sort of what they're paying for mm -hmm. and to uh, understand a little bit more about what we do and what we go through and and that uh, that this is real police work and as far as taking the law into your own hands and the old ignorance of the law is no excuse it's important to know what's expected of you as a citizen I guess yes and I would say that if it doesn't feel right it doesn't smell right it's probably not right and that uh, our mo mothers and fathers gave us lots of common sense that we can use and I think if people use that then they'll realize that what they're doing is probably illegal and if they have a question they can call us I mean, we're you glad go. to help them out and you can call that's that's a good way to round out this segment yes. a very special thanks to officer Ronnie Ward and in, in addition a captain uh, Matt Edwards who are representing the Bowling Green Police Department we've been talking about something called the Citizens Police Academy and you can call the Bowling Green Police Department to find out more now if you want to find out more about the upcoming Sokey Book Fest then stay tuned to Kentucky Outlook we're going to have a preview up next Kentucky Outlook continues. I'm Barbara Deeb. Well, get ready. If you like to read or if you just want to see what those authors really look like, you can stop by what has become one of the top attractions in the state of Kentucky. It's the Sokey Book Fest or the Southern Kentucky 
Festival of Books. To find out more about what's coming, we're going to welcome the coordinator, the lady who has spent a lot of time getting ready for this, Christy Lowry. Thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm. In addition, we're joined by Jennifer Bailey, who is the Community Relations Manager with Barnes & Noble in Bowling Green. Now this uh, 15th year, right? Mm -hmm. That's 15. huge. It and is. it's held at the Carol Nicely Center in it Bowling is. Green. And so this is a collaboration, right? It's not just Western Kentucky University. Right. Help us understand who's involved. Well, Barnes & Noble, WKU Libraries, and the Warren County Public Library, we're all equal partners in it. And I collaborate with Barnes & Noble and Warren County Public Library to decide what authors to come and basically make all of the decisions associated with it. So the buck stops here, baby. No, because it's always been, and like I say, it has become one of the top attractions in the state of Kentucky. Um, deciding what authors are going to come. Mm -hmm. That's always, that's like having a show and deciding what guests you're going to get. A lot of what people don't realize is that while we would love to have so-and-so or so-and-so, often they're not available at the time the book festival falls. Right. So it really becomes a matter of putting the puzzle pieces together? Yes, it does. And there are certain authors that we invite every year, and every year they turn us down. I always say I invite Stephen King every year, and every year he turns me down very politely, and I appreciate that. But <laughs> What's he say? Just oh, they just write that, can't do it. And actually, he doesn't do events like ours that often, except for good friends. So I'm going to become a good friend of him. We'll get him here eventually. <laughs> just keep plugging away. I will. I'll keep trying. So that's basically it, just seeing who's available. Now, you'll collaborate with Jennifer, because you are there in the trenches at the store, the Barnes & Noble store, where you're seeing, you know, we have a lot of people reading this. Is that kind of input? Yeah, also we, um, we share that input with, with Christy and the public library. Um, a lot of times what's read in the store and what's checked out in the library are two different things. So we come together and try and find that demographic. That's um, a good idea. I yeah. hadn't thought about that. You would just think that if it's a bestseller, everybody's going to be reading it, right? Not necessarily mm -hmm. always the case. Now, so. when you say we try to find that demographic, what demographic? Because it would be so hard if anyone's ever been to a book festival, or in particular the Soki Book Festival. Wow, you look around that uh, Carol Nicely Conference Center, and it's a huge demographic from all ages. Mm -hmm. And it's always surprising to see what sells, what, what sells a lot at Soki Book Fest. We've learned Civil War books are great. Anything about Abraham Lincoln will sell. Hmm. But then we have YA books have sold really well of young late. Adult. Yes, young adult books. And then we try to find that headliner that will have the cross appeal, like Henry Winkler, where not just readers are going to come out to see Henry Winkler. So. Well, she, she spoiled the surprise. No, actually, if you've seen any of the publicity related to this event, yes, the Fonz, Henry Winkler, is the headliner. And when I say that to people, I, I get such an interesting response. Really? The Fonz? I didn't know he wrote books. Well, he's a multi-talented guy. Not only does he write books, but he produces uh, television programs. He's in movies. So how did that come to be? Well, every year, he's one of those every year we check on. and. Lisa Rice, the head of the public library in particular this past year, just said, can we just try Henry Winkler again? And so I did, and he was thrilled to be coming back to Bowling Green. Apparently he was here 20 years ago, 25 oh. years ago, or at least in the area, and so he was thrilled to come back, and we set it up. It was that easy. And he's coming. So what people may not realize is he write book, writes books, and is it a children's book or a young adult? He has children's books. They're for older elementary, and they, the Hank Zipser series and the Ghost Buddy series. And the Hank Zipser series is actually the one that focuses on his experiences in school as a child. He was diagnosed late with dyslexia, hmm. and so he, he struggled a little bit in school, and so he translated that into the series of books that really very funny, of course, and um, an interesting read. And reluctant readers will enjoy it, and people who aren't reluctant readers. So. Now, um, a reluctant reader, mm -hmm. I've heard that term before, but some of our viewers, I could see them when you said that, they said reluctant viewer or reader. What exactly does that mean? Someone who doesn't like to read. Just period? <laughs> period. I have, I have four children and two of my boys are reluctant readers. No mm -hmm. doubt about it. You have to force them to read. And, and the other two just eat it up. Oh, yes. 
That's yes. crazy. Well, while we're in the TV genre and talking about headliner Henry Winkler, who will be at the Soki Book Fest, let's also talk about another TV. We can transition right into that. The Waltons, if uh, some of you remember that program. One of the daughters that was used to be on The Waltons, she's going to be there. Go ahead. Yes. Spill Aaron. it. Spill it. <laughs> Mary McDonough. Mary McDonough will be there. She played Erin Walton on The Waltons. And she was in Bowling Green for the public library for an event for them. And she had such warm response that they asked if we would invite her back again because people were begging her to come back again. So I contacted her, and she was again thrilled to be coming back and so she is an advocate as well for body image issues for teens but everybody mm -hmm. and so we decided to develop a breakfast where she would give her workshop on that and so there are t there is one event that you have to pay for the tickets for and that's the breakfast with Mary McDonough but if people want to meet her and don't want to come to the breakfast she will be signing books later in the day as well so this is a huge event how many authors are you going to have we will have 140 authors. 140 authors. Mm -hmm. And then Barnes & Noble has a big role there at the event as well. Mm -hmm. What's that role? We, um, Barnes & Noble orders all of the books for all of the authors, um, and we set them all up, just like we display books in the store. Every author has anywhere between, well, obviously one, but one book up to 30 different oh titles. My. And we try and have everything represented. Um, so that way everybody has a big choice and selection of what, what they want. So. Well, and then when we talked about demographic, what people don't realize is that we have young, I mean children's books, all the way to young adult books, and then many adult books along the way. So there, there's a great cross mix. And there's nothing like the eyes of a child, because I've been there and witnessed this, when the author who wrote their favorite book mm -hmm. is there and signs it, oh my gosh, talk about making an impression. And if you have a reluctant reader, this might be a great opportunity to bring them out and let them know that this is the guy who wrote this or this is the woman who wrote It's really very cool. So 140 authors are going to be there. It takes place on Saturday, mm -hmm. April, April 20th. 20th. It starts at, authors will start signing from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, Mary McDonald's breakfast will be at 8 a.m and the tickets to hear Henry Winkler speak will start being available at 7 a.m., although he doesn't speak until 10 a.m., but we expect a large number of people to want to hear him speak, and we're not going to sell the tickets. We're not giving them away ahead of time. It's just first come, first serve. And uh, there are also different book panels that take place if you want to hear your favorite author. You know, he might be teamed up with two or three other authors that would talk to you. Um, I hope I say his name right, Chuck Sambacino. Mm -hmm. He also can give some pointers on if you're interested in learning more about writing. Yes, mm -hmm. Chuck is the editor of the Guide to Literary Agents, which is based up in Cincinnati, fortunately. Mm -hmm. So every now and then we get him to come down, and he is the headlining author at the Kentucky Writers Conference the day before Bookfest, where writers of all levels can come in and learn from the authors who are going to be at Bookfest the next day on the craft of writing. And Chuck has ties to the writing industry that you know, nobody else does. So he's a good one for... for good one to know. Yes, definitely. Good one to know. And incidentally, WKU Public Television will continue with its annual tradition. And thanks to the graciousness of these, these people who helped put together the Soki Book Fest, we will be on site shooting interviews with some of these authors as part of our Outside the Book program that we bring you during the summer. So, so we always get really excited about that. Okay, so we got Mary McDonough, we have Henry Winkler, there's a whole lot more. In particular, one that's near and dear to my heart, and it just so happens he's a Louisville native, Bob Edwards. Words, the former host of Morning Edition on All Things Considered. Yes. He's now with Sirius Radio. He's written another book? He has. He's written My Life in the Box, I believe it's called, and it's a memoir including his time with NPR and his, his leaving of NPR and what that was all about. Uh, he will be presenting at Bookfest at 9 a.m. on Saturday morning, the 20th, and we're excited to meet him. I haven't met him before, so I'm excited to meet him, too. Very laid-back guy, let me just tell you. But, you know, once you hear that distinctive voice, you'll know that's Bob Edwards. I've heard that voice before. So it's an exciting something for everyone, mm -hmm. in my opinion. And it just keeps moving, and there are things for children. And so do you have a favorite author who's coming, Jennifer? Uh, Amy Ignato. She wrote Popu The Popularity Papers. That's my daughter's favorite. So we're excited about that. So. That's neat. And what about you? You can't say, can you? 
I can. I have lots of <laughs> oh, favorites. Oh, you'll get in trouble. <laughs> well, no. in the days, in the weeks, months leading up to Bookfest, I try to read as many of the Bookfest authors' books as I can. So I'm excited to meet a lot of them that I haven't met before because now I've read their books. So. We have Allison Atley, who wrote The Typewriter Girl, which is her first book, and she's a Kentucky native, and it was great. And Frank Bill wrote Donnie Brook. It's his first novel, and I'm looking forward to meeting him. And then my old favorites, like Lee Martin, who was a Pulitzer finalist for The Bright Forever. So I'm Lots excited to meet a lot of them. <laughs> it is. And it's just, you know, it, it, to be in the midst of all those books, mm -hmm. it's just kind of neat. So help us re, uh, remind our viewers, it's the Southern Kentucky Book Festival. It's coming up on Saturday, April 20th. And uh, admission? Admission is free. We do ask that people not bring outside items to be signed at BookFest. We will have lots of books for Henry and for Mary. We will have copies of their DVDs on hand. But if we start bringing in outside stuff, then it, it gets complicated for our friends from Barnes & Noble. And if people bring in Happy Days paraphernalia and stuff, then that gets into contract issues as far as what uh -huh. he's allowed to sign and everything. Well, that's a good opportunity to share that with the audience. So it starts at what time? The signing and selling will start at 9 a.m. Okay. Signing and selling, 9 a.m. Central Time, and that's at the Carol Nicely Center, mm -hmm. which is pretty accessible. It is. It's on Campbell Lane. You can get to it from Nashville Road or Campbell Lane. So. Okay. It's right there. And it will go until what time? 3 p.m. Until 3 p.m. So if you can't get there first thing in the morning, go in the afternoon and meet your favorite authors. So we've got uh, headliners Henry Winkler, Mary McDonough, Bob Edwards, Catherine Howe is coming. She is. Yeah, she's a, quite a popular she is. author as well. The Physic and Book of Deliverance Stain was her New York Times bestseller. I want you on my trivia team when it comes time. <laughs> Jennifer, words of wisdom encouraging everyone to get out there and uh, visit the Soki Book Fest. Come out and see your favorite authors. Say hi. It's always fun to hear their stories on how they mm -hmm. came to be a writer and how they get their inspiration to write their books. I'm a big fan. I always tell everybody those books, they take you away. You can go to a different place when you're reading a book. So, so true. Many different opportunities so at the book we'll festival. We'll see you at the Soki Book Fest. You will. For sure. And I hope that we will see you there as well on April 20th, starting at 9 a.m. at the Carol Nicely Center. My thanks to Jennifer Bailey and Christy Lowry. That's going to wrap it up for this week's edition of Kentucky Outlook. Until next time, stay safe.